Mitt was looking at me like he was ready to wring my neck, and I'm thinking, oh, geez. We're joined today by Jeff Renard, co-CEO of Audix Group. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Jeff, in preparation for this interview, I've been reading uh, a bit about your career, and it's a truly storied career. Why don't we recap it briefly? and uh, take a little walk, if you could, on a linear timeline, just take a little walk from Bain and Company, Bain Capital, and now Audex. I joined Bain and Company coming out of Stanford Law School, and about a month into my career, Mitt Romney and Coleman Andrews, the two vice presidents Bill Bain had asked to help found this internal venture capital group that Bain and Company was trying to get off the ground uh, that they were calling Bain Capital. Uh, they were uh, out in the Palo Alto office. Coleman uh, asked me if I wanted to join Bain Capital as one of the two first associates. So I took all of about three minutes to think it over and said yes. So spent the first 15 years of my career at Bain Capital. Initially there were uh, seven of us. Um, for those of you who saw the picture that uh, when Mitt was running for president had guys with $20 bills in their mouth hamming it up after we raised our first fund. Uh, that was the initial group of the seven of us. Um, that, uh, that picture seemed like a good idea at the time. I, I don't think Mitt thought it was such a good idea in 2012 when it uh, got played all over the internet, you know, sort of character, trying to characterize him as, uh, you know, a rich guy flaunting his wealth. At the time, none of us had any money, and I think, uh, I think we had to all borrow the $20 bills to stick them in our mouth so that we, uh, we could ham it up. But, uh, we, uh, you know, we started with a pool of 37 million. That was our first fund in 1984. It was the largest first time fund that had ever been raised uh, at that point. It's hard to believe in 1984, there was a total of only about a billion seven of capital in venture capital and leverage buyouts. The word private equity didn't even exist and there were maybe a hundred firms. The good news is we, uh, we, we got lucky on a couple of deals and, and uh, that first fund was very successful. Um, but you know it was, uh, you know it was a, a very interesting 15 years at Bain Capital as we grew and evolved. Bain is a great story, and if you look at some of the transactions, household names that Bain was involved in through its, through its history to date, it's really a who's who, in corporate America. Which one brings a smile to your face as you reflect on your Bain years? Well, there's a lot that bring, bring smiles to the face. We had, we had, you know, we were fortunate to you know, find some good investment opportunities. Tom Stenberg, the founder of Staples, actually finished the business plan in our office and you know, we helped him open the first store. One of our analysts was stocking shelves with him as it, it opened up over in Brighton. Our first buyout was a company called Calumet Coach Company that was based just south of Chicago in Calumet City, Illinois. That wound up being a very successful investment. We made 35 times our money on the transaction in a little over two years. So we wound up returning that whole first fund just on that, that one on investment. That one deal. And uh, that was a deal that I, I was uh, lucky enough to find. I, uh, I brought Mitt out with me to help with the negotiations with the entrepreneur. The, uh, the entrepreneur was kind of a crusty uh, character, so the first round didn't go so well. We wound up getting a deal done, and then you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the day after the deal when we went to see what we had acquired, you know, a couple of the managers decided to have some fun with uh, Mitt and me and you know, sort of said, geez, you know, why'd you buy this company? There's no customers like this. And, and Mitt was looking at me like he was ready to wring my neck. And I'm thinking, oh, geez. And then the guys broke out laughing. You know, they're sort of playing a practical joke. But uh, I had a few uneasy moments there and uh, a few. I, th I think Mitt's uh, stare burned, a, you know, burned the back of my shirt as he was uh, glaring at me. All the partners at Bain and Company had invested their own money, plus they viewed the reputation of Bain and Company as being on the line with Bain Capital. The last thing they wanted to do was be the consulting firm associated with the venture capital or buyout firm that, you know, lost money. What caused you to leave Bain and start Audax? So back in 1999, Mitt had decided he was going to leave Bain Capital to go run the Salt Lake City Olympics. So there was a lot of uncertainty about what the leadership of Bain Capital was going to be. All the rest of our colleagues at that point wanted to go do large cap private equity, wanted to take Bain Capital out of the middle market where most of our 
investing activity had happened during the 15 years I was there. I like the middle market. I actually enjoy the owner entrepreneurs and the relationships. And, and, and I, I just felt that, you know, my skill set and, and Mark's skill set lend itself to being able to work with middle market companies and make them into better businesses. I never saw myself as working for someone else. Uh, you know, for very long as a young person. I worked for 15 years for Mid at Bain Capital, and, um, you know, that's a testament to his leadership and management capabilities. Um, I, uh, you know, I sort of saw his, his taking this leave of absence as a, a real opportunity to, to, to go do something and give it a shot on my own. In 2015, the firm completed its 500th add-on transaction. You've given a little insight as to how you successfully are able to integrate so many firms. You know, you know, I have experienced at RSM going through integrations, and there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get an integration done so that you actually realize the synergies that you had anticipated when you looked at the two coming together to become greater than the parts, right? I know there's no pixie dust in this society. There's no bibbity bobbity boop magic wands. So how do you guys complete so many add-on transactions successfully? What secret sauce does Audex apply to get these add-ons to, uh, to realize the synergies that you anticipate? Well, if there was a secret sauce, I couldn't tell you. I, I, if I told oh, you, I'd have to there kill you. Be a and, I, and I wouldn't do it on, I wouldn't do it on video, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, there's no secret sauce. It's a lot of hard work, and we've just sort of built on that as time's gone by. And um, I think have you know refined our systems and processes so that we're you know we're we're uh, able to identify which platforms are well suited for our strategy, and then we work closely with the management teams to execute that strategy. Let's take the plane a little higher and look at the PE landscape. Talk a little bit about you know past, present, and look out in, onto the horizon in the future of uh, of private equity. If you look at the landscape of U.S. business in the mid 1980s, um, it was still pretty, you know, sloppy uh, in general. You know, American business had um, you know dominated the global economy after World War II, and you know started having some challenges in the 70s with hyperinflation and you know the oil crises um, in the early 1980s was when they really first started uh, you know, US business really first started confronting foreign competition you know Japanese imports and you know Germany and uh, other countries were starting to you know c compete in US markets and that was putting a lot of pressure on businesses today you know, in the in 2016, much of you know corporate America and and particularly the middle market, where I've spent virtually all my career in the middle market, the businesses are much better run. And so, as an investor, to make money as a private equity investor, we have to do something above and beyond what we could do 15 years ago or 30 years ago with these companies to to make money. You have to have a systematic way to add value and create value. Um, uh, to, to generate top returns in this industry. With so much capital committed to private equity, it's more and more complicated to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. Absolutely. And when there's too many dogs chasing too few cats, valuations have a tendency to stay high. Now, I will say, I've been in the business now 32 years, and every year, starting in 1985, actually late 84, I have heard the common wisdom being that there's too much money chasing too few deals. So every year that people have said relative to the prior year. So it's it's economics 101, you know, as you know, as it, you know, supply if demand is high, you know, supply keeps increasing to meet that demand and the supply of capital has increased every single year. You know, the total amount of capital under management has increased every single year I've been in the business. Let's talk about the regulatory environment today that exists in the U.S. In particular, how it affects Audex. Now, you're lenders, so the banking regula uh, regulatory uh, environment uh, should be beneficial to you. The tier one capital requirements have really led to, you know, sort of a mass exodus of the banks from the, the middle market 
you know, senior loan market. And that, that, so our senior loan business is, you know, one of many, you know, entities that is, you know, helping to fill that void and provide capital to, to borrowers that in the past would have, you know, most likely uh, gone to banks for, for that capital. Talk about the regulatory environment as it relates to the private equity business. Uh, how have you dealt with the requirements? There's a, you know, an enormous amount of time and energy put into compliance. Um, we actually have three people in our compliance department. We have seven lawyers on staff full-time uh, uh, here in Boston. We have three of them spending uh, the majority of their time on compliance related issues. And, um, you know, is it a good thing? I think ultimately it probably is a good thing for the industry because, in re you know, looking back there have been practices that um, theoretically you know, sophisticated institutional investors ought to have negotiated uh, for protection, but I think the SEC has actually brought, you know, a level of clarity as to what the ground rules are and, and, and made more explicit the, the need to disclose to investors anything that could potentially be a conflict of interest. So let's go into our final segment. Good. We call this our lightning round. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Don't give them too much thought and just a uh, stream of consciousness. It's dangerous. Interest rates, 2016, what do you anticipate will uh, happen the rest of this year? I think they'll stay flat. Okay, crude oil. So crude oil, um, the U.S. is now potentially self-sufficient in energy with shale oil drilling. So I believe there'll be some fluctuations, but I don't think we're gonna see oil much above $50 a barrel. How many years until we experience our next recession here in the U.S.? Hmm. My guess is it'll be sometime in the next year and a half to three years. I'm a long-suffering, die-hard jet fan, and you've benefited from our some of our missteps. When will Tom Brady retire? I think he got a few more years. He, he says he wants to keep playing. He looks terrific. Last year, he looked as strong as I've seen him in the last four or five years. Mm -hmm.